Uh, so welcome to this webinar. I'm going to try to talk a little bit more about PSD2 at least and how we see it being used and how we see it being bringing value to, to companies uh, in Europe. First, I, I want to try to do a, a refresher on what PSD2 actually is and also what happened in the past in the past years. So it's it's not really um, a surprise for you that uh, in the past five to ten years we started to see more and more uh, innovative solutions towards consumers, but also companies, uh, with some of them leveraging on billions of users. You have Apple Pay, for instance, or Facebook launching uh, payments in Messenger, uh, also Amazon Payments, Uber Payments. So there's been a lot of moving giants in the payment space. What we've seen also is that there has been a lot of development on account information itself. So not just payment, but also you've seen uh, personal finance advisors, apps uh, connecting to your bank account and using technologies that were not necessarily seen as really secured and really uh, well managed, such as web scraping, for instance. And web scraping is really the idea that you're going to simulate the actions of a, of a consumer over a web browser. So you're basically going to write code that will automate the clicks and the text that is being answered, entered in a, in a text field in a web page. And so that's how a lot of companies were fetching account data. And you saw uh, a lot of companies worldwide using such technologies in the past years. Why did those companies and technologies emerge? Is because the, the customer's needs and the customer's expectations have evolved from traditional banking or traditional accounting. Of course, there are, there are many of those that, uh, that you already know of. It's probably also some of, uh, some of the concerns that your customers have or some of the demands that your customers have. Uh, but overall, it's really the idea of getting it cheaper, faster, and better. <laughs> I think it's the same for every industry, but it's now coming more and more into the finance and accounting sector. And back then, I would say you had two options and same for traditional players, but also for banks, I would say, is to try to do this type of innovation and try to do this in-house or try to do partnerships. And the, the European banking authorities started seeing that move and they thought, okay, there's there's something happening, uh, something happening in, a, in an unstructured way. And also something is happening that is very different country to country. In France, for instance, you have quite a few uh, personal finance manager apps that that have popped up even 10 years ago you also have uh, in in Belgium you had the coda format that was uh, a way for corporate uh, to get information from their bank account into their own software that's what we've been doing for 25 years at Isabel Group you've had also uh, in the UK also a lot of uh, finance apps uh, both for business and consumers popping up well, the UK is not part of Europe anymore, but at that point it still was. So it's, it's something that was really boiling up and banks obviously were not really happy about this either. And so the regulator decided to step in. They decided to say, okay, we, we introduced a while ago PSD1, so the Payment Ser Service Directive 1, which introduced the SEPA zone and also the SEPA direct debit uh, scheme. So why don't we make a second iteration of this? Why don't we make a thing called PSD2 and make sure we give easier access to third-party software, to payment capabilities in banks, but also this time, let's add account information access as well. So they tried to kind of bring order to, to what was happening, which was honestly uh, a little bit the far west back then. It still is to some extent, but back then it was a little bit less clear, uh, I would say. You could do what you could not do and how you could actually do it. So they tried to bring that, that sense of clarity and, and that structure into the market because we're still dealing with making payments and accessing account information, which is qualified as, as sensible information uh, in most cases. So when they started uh, shaping PSE2, uh, it started in tw 2016, actually. Uh, or even even sooner, I think that the first discussion started sooner, but they started really drafting this directive later on. 
it started entering into law in some countries already as soon as January 2018. Now we need to we need to distinguish two things in that new directive. We need to distinguish the law itself that introduces new concepts such as SCA, which is the abbreviation of strong customer authentication, which I'm going to talk about a bit later, and also a uh, ask banks to open up some of their backends, uh, including payment capabilities and account information. So uh, there, there's a lot really that's going on there that also has impact on card payments with the introduction of SCA. And it's a, it's a much wider law than just payment and account information, but in a nutshell, that's, that's, that's really the idea of it. The idea is really to to say we need more competition, we need more uh, technology, in the finance sector and we need to reduce the barrier to entry at least that's the spirit of the law that doesn't mean that that's what happened but that's the spirit of the law itself and it's starting becoming a law in czech republic ireland italy france and and, and other countries starting from january 2018. next to this law the european banking authority also released what is called an rts it's a regulatory technical standard it's kind of a high level specification of what should happen. And between the enforcement of the actual law and the enforcement of the RTS, there is a little bit more than, than a year that, uh, that was supposed to happen. So if you look at the timeline, in Belgium, uh, we actually got it as a law in March 2018. Uh, in Q3 2018, that's when it became a law in some other countries. I think uh, for the Netherlands, it, it came either at that point or a bit later. And then there were some milestones that the banks and the TPPs had to comply with. The TPPs being a third party provider. Uh, so meaning it's a, it's a FinTech or a bank acting as a FinTech, meaning accessing accounts from other banks. And so the banks themselves had to release interfaces. They had to create interfaces similar to the kind of things you, had, you have with the bank coupling in the Netherlands, but they had to build them in the scope of that new regulation. And they had to provide a sandbox as soon as they could uh, in December 2018 so that third-party players or third-party uh, uh, TPPs uh, could connect to and test those APIs. Uh, looking at the deadline of September 2019, obviously, which is when, starting from that date, all the previous technologies used by fintechs uh, would be deemed illegal. So it means that what I talked about, which is web scraping or other techniques like reverse engineering, would be considered as illegal starting from September 2019. So there was this kind of limbo period within which you, we were using both previously used technologies and connection to those APIs in order to make sure we could actually get access to data and being able to initiate payments at the bank side. So that's, that's a little bit technical and also legal mumbo jumbo in some cases, but I think that to bring us back now to how do you see, how do you create value on top of this? You need to look at this as a piece of law that actually forces banks to open up their systems. And of course, some of them are going to open up using the same standards, but a lot of them are going to be using different standards or no standards at all. So if you want to connect to, let's say, a thousand banks, you will probably be in the ballpark of at least two to three hundred ways of connecting to them because some of them are going to share a similar platform. Some of them are going to be done at group level, like ING, for instance. And some of those are going to be split and separated uh, for each entity. And in France, it's even worse. It's uh, the same bank can have a different backend per department. And even sometimes in the Department of France, you have different uh, types of uh, IT systems to connect to. So it can become very complex. And when you are a fintech or an accounting software, or even a bank trying to connect to other banks, dealing with that complexity has a huge cost. And that's where uh, API aggregation uh, comes into play. So meaning that we try to see how we can simplify this. And that's something that we built indeed uh, in the scope of what we're doing at Isabel Group is we said, okay, we want to have a single connection, a single interface to 
thousands of bytes. So that's the cost of implementation is only to do it once and not to do it for all the banks that are supported behind. It's really creating that that middle layer, that layer in the middle that simplifies connection to all the banks. And that's what a lot of aggregators have been doing in the past uh, three years, I would say, all over Europe, there's, there's plenty of us, but not all of them can leverage on the same types of services that we can do at Isabel Group, obviously. Now, a, a small word about what we call the SCA, and that's something that, that you probably already have heard of if you're doing e-commerce or anything else. Now, SCA stands from Strong Customer Authentication. What you need to understand in, in PSD2 is that there is no contract between the TPP and the bank, which here, the legal mumbo jumbo that's used in the law is ASPSP, Account Servicing Payment Service Provider. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's a little bit complex, but uh, uh, let's say it's a bank. <laughs> there is no contract between the TPP and the bank. But the TPP, which is a fintech, which is an accounting software, which is I mean, any any application that wants to initiate payment at the bank or access account information needs to be regulated. So if you want to connect directly to the interface of the bank, you need to be regulated. Okay. And the model that is being brought by the law is, is to say, okay, we have a payment service user. We have a, a, a platform user that is going to give an explicit consent. So, and by explicit consent, we mean it in the way GDPR means it. It needs to be specific, freely given, and ambiguous, affirmative, informed, etc. So, you need to give an explicit consent to that platform to process your data and to connect to the bank to go get it and do something with it. The TPP, so this this regulated platform, needs to then redirect the the, the user to the bank to confirm that technical link. And so that's that's the part, I would say that's the three parts of a consent in PSD2. You need to have the consumer that gives explicit consent to the TPP, but that also um, validates that consent or at least uh, enforces that consent with a technical link between the TPP and the bank. And that's this, this kind of trio that is kind of unique uh, in the way PSD2 is designed. And it's only when that consent is valid that the data can flow from the bank to the application, which is, it has also a lot of constraints for the regulated entity. We need to use specific types of certificates to connect to the bank, et cetera, et cetera. So you can be sure that when you have really a TPP that is regulated and, and that also is uh, being overseen by, by the national competent authority, uh, the DNB in the Netherlands or the, the National Bank in Belgium, they also get audited. They need to prove that they're doing this right, et cetera, et cetera. So PSD2 is, is bringing that model where data can flow from the bank to some specific uh, third-party uh, players. But you need to be regulated and you need to go through kind of a lengthy process, which means that PSD2, who was trying to bring more competition and bring more services to the market, is at the same time also making it a bit more difficult to get there because you need to be regulated, you need to show that you're doing things right. So it's also why very small companies, small fintechs, are having a lot of trouble sometimes finding enough funding, I would say, to, to actually get regulated. And that's why you start seeing services that allow, I would say, uh, consumers to decide that the data that is at a TPP, that the data that is in this uh, in this regulated entity, can be shared with another platform, and that's what we built with Ponto, uh, and that's what is being used by IDIN as well. So just to give you a little bit uh, of background from our perspective, what actually happened on this date of September 2019, where everything was supposed to happen, what happened? Not much, almost nothing, I would say, uh, because the bank interfaces were not really ready and we couldn't really get proper technical support from banks and so that was really a struggling moment uh, i would say for for most of the fintechs most of the tpps uh, there was a lot of discussions with the regulators and also the documentation that was provided by the banks was not really matching uh, how it was implemented so it was kind of a weird moment i would say and a sad moment for uh, for for the industry 
but fortunately the regulators the local regulators actually stepped in and uh, tried to make this clear what was uh, what needed to be done and so when you look at the numbers from September 2020 we saw a 600 percent growth from January to September uh, of course we didn't start from a lot but it, it was an interesting uh, progression to see and we we saw at least on our platforms and those were the numbers only in Belgium at that point, but 77% uh, of B2C usage was on the big uh, banks in Belgium and 85 of the B2B on the big four. We saw the quality of the support uh, getting much better, but we were starting to see that the stability of the APIs were not that great. So with the traffic increasing, those interfaces, which we call APIs, uh, were not really stable. And so we needed to work again uh, with the banks and the regulators to see how to improve that. Um, and then if you if you look a little bit more about what's happening now, and, and there I, I'm showing the, I would say two graphs from, from the Netherlands and Belgium about the traffic that is actually coming through our platform. So we saw an 11 fold increase in the traffic again, uh, actually number of bank accounts. So it's uh, it means that uh, we really start to see this growing a lot and it's a sustained growth. So it's not something that we see slowing down, uh, which is good news. It means that the machine is starting to actually <laughs> uh, bring uh, some value and also uh, getting used. Uh, we see obviously that the split of traffic or number of accounts that we manage on our platforms for the two countries matches pretty much the market share of the different banks so there's not really a big surprise there but but it's interesting to see for instance in belgium and also in uh, in the netherlands that the smaller banks have been more popular recently so we saw an increase in the popularity of smaller banks and and especially for ourselves in on triodos for instance uh, apparently at least on in the netherlands we are one of the few that actually deliver triodos uh, connectivity i don't know if it's still the case today by the way uh, but but it used to be like that in the, in a, a few months uh, prior and we started really seeing those surprises popping up like bonk for instance or triodos and, and and smaller banks that we didn't really know that well uh really uh, really popping up in our statistics there is still some way to go. So the, the bottom line and why am I showing you this, uh, it's also to tell you that it's still a journey that is ongoing. There are still some features, for instance, that are not uh, still, still not, I would say, perfectly usable, like bulk payments, for instance. Uh, we, see this for, we see this to be more advanced and more, um, I would say, more stable in the Netherlands than in Belgium. Uh, but for instance, we have almost zero capabilities to do bulk payments in France, which is a pain uh, for us today. In some cases, we still see in some countries like Luxembourg, for instance, they still require customers, uh, B2B customers, to sign additional mandates so that accounts can be accessed, uh, which is a pain as well. But there's differences countries from countries to countries, uh, things that go well, things that don't necessarily go well. And we're constantly working with the banks themselves and the regulators to make sure that uh, everybody's compliant in the end. So it's still something that is a, it's a journey uh, that we're on and, uh, and it's not stopping obviously, but, uh, but there's still some way to go. The future evolutions that we see popping up, uh, instant payment is starting to be supported uh, by several banks. So through the, uh, the PSD2 API, which is a good, uh, a good thing. We also see that EBA published an opinion, uh, so the European Banking Authority published an opinion suggesting that credit card statements should be also in those APIs, uh, but we can expect that this is going to be interpreted by banks in different countries in different way. So yeah, it's, it's um, again, it's an ongoing journey and we see the trend going more towards open finance. And uh, what we can say today is that the connectivity that exists is, is, is really usable in some countries like the Netherlands, for instance, is perfectly capable of bringing value to, to consumers and also to companies. So let's, let's zoom in a little bit in uh, what people use it for today. Um, they use it mainly, today the main use case we see is payments, reconciliation and accounting. Those are really the, 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 the biggest package of what we see. Um, we see a lot of uh, companies willing to do invoice reconciliation automatically uh, thanks to real-time account information that we can provide 
it saves them time. Uh, we have companies in Belgium that were usually spending uh, two to three hours a day uh, because they had a really big influx of, of payments and a lot of small invoices. Uh, two to three hours a day, reducing that to a few minutes, uh, just matching the unmatched items. Uh, thanks to the, the data feed that we can provide. Uh, dash, we, we could also see kind of a, a dashboarding um, um, uh, dashboarding use cases uh, starting to uh, starting to pop up, and also um, <clears throat> uh, we start now that we support more payment, uh, more I would say more banks in the payment space. Uh, we start seeing ERPs and and software integrate payments directly in their software. So the idea is that you have you have a list of your invoices, your 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 uh, purchase invoices, and uh, you can directly pay the invoice from that from that software. You don't have to log into your bank uh, app. You start the flow from your ERP, and everything is pre-filled in the bank app, and then you can just pay. Uh, so that that these kinds of flow are are becoming more and more popular. What we start seeing as well, and, and that's maybe a, a bit, a still a bit futuristic or far-fetched for, for some of you, is that we actually have pushed Ponto inside a platform called Zapier. And, and Zapier is, is what we call an, an automation platform, a workflow automation platform. You can basically drag and drop actions and events. So you can say, for instance, when my balance changes on this bank account, send me an SMS. Or when I receive a payment from that specific uh, supplier or counterpart, uh, send me an email with the details. Or uh, whenever there's a new transaction, send it to QuickBooks or send it to another software. So it's really a way for companies to connect the systems that they have, that the SaaS software, so the, the online cloud software that they use, to connect all of this together really in the way they want it not in the way that was designed for them by, by a software provider, but really in the way they want to use it and the way they, uh, they, that brings value to them. Uh, and of course, the real-time cash insight, which is the dashboard use case I was talking about, which is, uh, which is also uh, powered by the fact that we can bring real-time information. So not everything is real-time at the bank, obviously, but we can bring uh, information that is near real time, I would say, a meaning that we can go and fetch your balance at the moment you ask it. It's not going to be yesterday's balance. It's going to be the exact same balance that you see in your banking app. So if you do have instant payment support, that balance would be updated in real time as well. And so that can really bring uh, more granularity to the kind of reporting and the kind of dashboarding that you can do. And we see this more and more popping up. And we see this more and more popping up with existing tools, obviously, uh, like IDIN is doing with Business Central. Uh, this is clearly for us a very interesting use case because uh, we don't want to change the way companies work. We want to allow them to uh, introduce banking anywhere it makes sense in their in their current way of working. So to conclude this, I would say that for us, the, we believe that the one-size-fits-all model is dead. And we believe that actually PSD2 is allowing us to, to get into this integrated uh, banking era. And, and I will I will conclude by by using the tagline of Ponto itself, which is your money, your rules. Uh, we don't think that banking should should come in the way of helping you to make business, and we don't think that your banking app or your banking capabilities should be a drag uh, for you.